Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. And I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. Hello, Dee. Hello, Carol. How is beautiful Indiana today? It's gorgeous as always. I would tell you that whether it was raining or snowing. Well, it's not going to be snowing in June, but it's always pretty in Indiana, especially now, middle of June. (laughs) It's always pretty in Indiana? Come now. Really? I was born and raised in Indiana. That's all I know. (laughs) Well, it's beautiful in Oklahoma today, too. We had a cold front come through yesterday and more rain, but today it is sunny and gorgeous. So, should we start with a quote? We should start with a quote, and I have one for us for our first flower. You ready? Uh Uh-huh. Never say there is nothing beautiful in the world anymore. There is always something to make you wonder in the shape of a tree, the trembling of a leaf. Albert Schweitzer. Hmm. So that makes it kind of a big mystery. What would our flower be today since it's talking about a tree? Our flower would actually be Japanese maples. Right. A lot of people don't know that Japanese maples bloom. Like other maples do, too. They do. But Japanese maples bloom. And they're very, very pretty. They have a lovely, lovely bloom in addition to all the beautiful leaves that are on Japanese maples. Yes. The the flowers are kind of a parasol-looking flower and almost an upside-down umbel. And I think they look like fairy parasols. They do. And then you get all those little seeds that float around the garden. You do, which they're tiny seeds, so they're not like big maple seeds, so they're not so hard to get rid of. So, do you grow any Japanese maples? D, this is going to shock you. I have no Japanese maples. Not a single one? No. Well, let's try to talk you into one, shall we? Yeah, because we know how dangerous it is for me to talk about plants because the next thing I know, (laughs) I'm buying one. So, way back in the day... Um, When I first started gardening, there were like only two Japanese maples that you could get in the state of Oklahoma. I don't know if it was the same thing in Indiana. One was Bloodgood, and the other one was Crimson Queen. And they were two totally different types of Japanese maples, but both had red foliage. Okay? Right. Crimson Queen was the type that arches over and is kind of a cascading effect because it is a dissectum, and dissectum means dissected or lobed leaves, and it almost has a ferny foliage. Um, And then Bloodgood had these big, strong red leaves and grew very vertical and very wide, and those were the two you could get. But now there's a whole new world of Japanese maples, at least that I can get here, and I assume you can get them too because... Hybridizers have worked hard to make some pretty ones. There are some phenomenal Japanese maples, and it wouldn't take much for me to find one or a dozen that I really like. I just don't really have the space for them. Yeah, you need some space. I probably have, I I didn't count all my trees for this episode, but, oh, I have at least 16, at least. And I grow mostly in the shade. Um, because they like some shade here, or I grow them on the east side of the house where they get morning sun and afternoon shade so that their leaves don't get hurt too bad. And I have a couple of varieties that have variegated leaves. You know, back in the day, everybody wanted a red one. But then we found out that if you planted one like a coral bark, which has pink bark, and then it has bright green leaves, and then in the fall, it turns yellow, kind of a yellow-orange, a really pretty yellow-orange. If you grow the red ones, they just stay red. Right. And I I like, if I was going to choose Japanese maples, I tend to like more the ones that have the really limey green or soft, almost yellow foliage, um, and mm-hmm. then have a spectacular fall color. That's the ones I right. tend to gravitate towards. And everybody likes something a little different. Um, I have several that are red. One I really love called Tamukiyama, which is a dissectum type, but it grows tall and kind of out like in a vase type shape, but then the branches hang down a little bit. I grew, I started growing it 12 years ago, approximately, and it's really big now, and I take a lot of pictures of it because I like it. One of the reasons I like it so much is that it's super easy to grow. It can handle the sun. 
I like the red in this particular part of the garden, but I also grow a lot of the green ones. And then the two variegated ones I have are peaches and cream and butterflies. Um, butterflies is relatively new, so I don't have anything to say about it, but peaches and cream, what a pretty, pretty tree. I found it at a local nursery down in Norman uh, in spring, so I got to see its spring foliage, and it comes out this gorgeous um, peachy orange color, and then it turns to kind of a peach and white throughout the summer, and then in the fall, it becomes that beautiful orange again. So what a, what a great plant. Now, if you want a green one that's super cheap, easy to find, you can get Viridis. Viridis is a, a dissectum, if I'm remembering right, because it has very, very delicate foliage. Um, very common, at least here. And it turns the most gorgeous yellow in the fall. And I have two of those. Hmm. I have a few. I have a few Japanese maples. Well, and I was thinking of just a few. Yeah, sixteen is more than a few. <laughs> D. It's almost a national collection, which we talked about on our last podcast. <laughs> Not quite. There are all those hybridizers out there. They probably have the national collection, but they are wonderful plants. Did you know they're not that easy? They're not that hard to grow. They're not hard to grow at all. In fact, they are hardy from zones five to eight. They're pretty easy to grow in fertile, well-drained soil. And this is all I do for mine. I have drip irrigation where I grow all of them. And I top mine off with back-to-nature compost, cotton seed, cotton hull compost every year. And I just make sure the drip system is turned on and not turned on too much. That's it. Super easy. They, I do prune them. Because I did something dumb. I planted... Shinda Sojo, I'm not saying that right, Shinda Sojo. I planted that one too close to the house, and so and it, and I didn't realize that it wasn't a cascading type because this was early in my love affair with them, and I just found one and loved the color of it. So it's too close to the house, and it gets too tall, so I, I pruned that one for that reason. But also, I pruned them to give them kind of an airy effect, because that's part of the point of the whole thing. And every once in a while, because they're maple trees, they'll throw off a shoot, you know, like this wild shoot that doesn't go with anything. And that's what you want to prune out. And you want to prune them all the way back to the stem. People think it's hard, but it's really not. So I, if I had room, I guess I would plant a Japanese maple, but I don't have room, D. So I'm not as tempted by this tree as I should be. Yeah. Mm. Well, maybe I can tempt somebody else who's listening to us. Um, they also handle heat pretty well in Oklahoma if they have some of that afternoon shade and protection from drying winds. And also, if you're going to grow the variegated one, what's the truth about most variegated foliage in the garden? It gets burned by the sun. They burn up in the sun. They absolutely burn up. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you grow. Variegation almost always wants a little shade. Almost always. They do. And also, don't overwater them. They like good drainage. One time, my watering system got messed up in part of the shade garden. I didn't realize it, and I killed my coral bark. It's called Sango Kaku. Um, but that's okay. I put another one in there that's, that's an orange variety. So um, just remember that dissectum types are more cascading, and then the other acer palmatums tend to be less so. So that's something to keep in mind. Also look at, at, the, at what the mature height's going to be. Because if I had done that with that one tree, it wouldn't be planted so close to the house. But there you go. Who hasn't planted something just a little too close to something else? Yeah, or the house, and then caused problems. One more thing is if you were really interested in Japanese maples, we'd like to suggest the Japanese maples, the complete guide to selection and cultivation by Peter Gregory and J.D. Vertries, because that's the book I bought when I started to get into them because I wanted to be successful. And I grow a lot under my oak trees, and they seem to really like it there. And I've gotten some new, I got some new ones last year, so... Just keep on, you know, changing varieties, get more. So have you, well, you've had a couple of die. Have you just ever taken one out because it was just simply in the wrong place? Well, I may have to take out that Shinda Shoujo, the one that's super tall that's on the end of the house. Um, I should have just put it out about three more feet, but that's okay. If I have to, I have to. Yeah. But right now I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to fix it by cutting it back. We'll see. I may destroy it, and then I'll have to take it out. I'm just telling people this because we all make mistakes, and that was a mistake I made. Yep, we've all made mistakes. So that's about it, 
about Japanese maples, right? That's it, because I don't really have a lot to add because I don't have any. Darn it. Well, maybe you should talk about the vegetable. I do have a vegetable garden, and I have a quote (laughs) for the vegetable garden. Are you ready? I am ready. One cannot garden successfully on the principle that one can work in the garden when there is nothing else to do, no one to play with, nowhere to go. Ida Bennett. (laughs) So uh, that is especially true of vegetable gardens because right. things happen fast in the vegetable garden. They Sometimes sure do. <laughs> you're gone a day or two and all stuff breaks loose. Exactly. You can have, uh, I, I weeded my garden pretty thoroughly over the weekend. I'm sure when I go out there, I'm like, where would all these weeds have come from? But we had rain and different things, so it happens. So we had rain too, and I was out there. I was out there before we went out of town, but I've been gone for three days, so I'm going to go out there to a mess. So let's just talk about um, the thing about a garden, and and you've mentioned it before. You get the garden growing really good, and you're just about ready to have stuff to pick, and the next thing you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to be gone for a week. So let's talk about how to prepare your garden to be gone for a week or longer. Sounds good. How do you prepare? Well, I don't leave my garden. I'm dedicated to it. I do leave occasionally. Wait a minute. That's not true. (laughs) I know. The main thing I think when you leave a garden is ask somebody to look in on it. And in exchange for looking in on it, they are welcome to harvest absolutely anything that looks ripe and ready to eat, especially squash. And tomatoes. And tomatoes. And green beans. Those two. And so, peas. And, well, <laughs> peas, peas, can go, peas can go crazy if you yeah. don't pick them. But the peas, peas are just about done. So what yes, do you, that's true. What do you do in your garden, D? Because you're going to leave your garden. Yeah, I left it, and I'm going to leave it again this week. Um, what do I do? I make sure it's all mulched. That's one thing I do. And I make sure all my watering is set up. And actually, I hire my youngest daughter to watch it for me and to pick anything that's that looks ripe. And she likes the only thing that might be ripe right now is because I've pulled out almost all the lettuce because it's basically done. We've been kind of hot. Um, maybe the, the the peas that I have left. There's a few, um, and also maybe the cherry tomatoes. We're getting really close in Oklahoma. I noticed Brad's atomic grape. That particular one has tomatoes all over it. Now, the good news about this is, well, first, my youngest daughter, Claire, is not that into gardening, but she likes cherry tomatoes. So it is not hard to convince the little darling to go out there and check out the strawberries and the cherry tomatoes and make sure they're okay. And I won't, I won't seed for squash until I get back. Yeah, that's a good idea. And, and uh, you kind of have to look at the calendar and say, when am I going to be gone? And you're right. It doesn't make sense to plant something if you know the main harvest for it's going to take place while you're gone and you're not going to be able to enjoy it. And the squash bugs. Remember, I have a, <laughs> I have a lot of squash bugs, so I have to be here to make sure I kill them daily, twice right. a day. Right, right. And that's something, you know, timing when you're going to plant stuff and knowing when things are going to be ready, that's something you get just from the experience of gardening and keeping track year to year of, like if I plant on this day, I usually harvest on this, you know, 60 days later or 55 days later for green beans. Right. And you look at your seed packets and your seed packets will tell you about how long it takes for this crop to mature or to be transplanted. So be sure you pick which one it is, you know, look at that. Because on tomatoes, it gives two dates. So look at your package, decide if you're going to be gone when that stuff is going to need to be harvested and if you're going to be gone, just wait, especially if you live in the South, like I do, we have a very long season, extremely long. So the squash, I have plenty of time to plant more squash or what I may do this year, because I am gone quite a bit off and on, I may just buy squash at the organic farmer's market. Well, there's an idea, but don't get too lazy, D. You got to have a vegetable I'm garden. Not. Oh, I have a vegetable garden, girl. I know. I even put some green beans in it. Yeah, it's good. So I just may not grow squash. Interesting. I don't mulch my vegetable garden like you mulch you your... What do you put down for your mulch? 
I really like straw in my vegetable garden. Sometimes it's hard to find because you don't want the weed seeds in it. But I also use shredded pine bark. The main thing on that is don't mix the pine bark in with the soil. You know, like if you dig a hole, move the, move the pine bark aside and then dig the hole and then bring the mulch back over to it because you don't want to mix it with your soil. You want it to decompose naturally. That way you won't lose nitrogen. Right. And I, I put a layer of mulch, which is basically shredded leaves and grass clippings from the lawn. I put that on the garden in the fall to add organic matter, but I don't necessarily mulch the growing garden. I guess I could. Well, I guess you don't have to because you get more rain normally. We do get a it's lot not of rain. As hot, and it's not as hot there. It's paradise so, here, D. I'm telling you, it's paradise. I know it's not paradise because I know you in the winter (laughs) and if it weren't for basketball you would be really unhappy so um I you know it's hotter here and it's drier usually not this year but usually so I go ahead and mulch it a little bit I don't put a lot of mulch though I'd say I put about if it's pine bark I put an inch and a half that's not a lot you know no and if it's the other straw it's just whatever goes down I have thought about um bagging up the grass as I mow a couple of times and you can put like the grass clippings around and my dad always Mm -hmm. did that when we were kids and it does keep down weeds and it helps to retain moisture and then you can just work that in in the fall and just adds organic matter so you know I might I'm not making any promises because you keep having to stop and empty the bag stop and empty the bag yeah and nobody wants to do that no um Bill kind of does that though with our front our front garden, I mean the front lawn, he bags it and then he goes and puts it on the leaf piles, the shredded leaf piles. And then I'll put a layer of shredded leaves in the fall when I pull everything up. Good. So I'm getting ready to plant my second crop of green beans. Wow. Really? I only planted my first one the other day. Well, I planted the first one. <laughs> it's been almost three weeks ago, so it's time. And this way I'll have some more It is because later. Explain that. Explain that to our listeners why you well, do that. Well, success, success, succession planning. planning is just merely planting things like green beans and spacing it a few weeks apart, plant a shorter rows, and then you don't get all your green beans at the same time. So I'll have fresh green beans two or three weeks after my first picking of green beans from the plants because they'll produce for a while but they start to taper off and then you've got a new crop that's coming Mm -hmm. on Um, and you can do the same thing with squash for example you can plant an early crop and then the plants start to peter out and they start to get mildews and things like that you can pull them out and then go to another spot and and plant and the the main thing is to find out your frost your, your typical average frost date and that's when the garden's done, except for things like lettuce and spinach that can tolerate light frost. Count back from that, and mm-hmm. so that's as late as you want to try to plant. Right, and you're talking about bush beans, not pole beans, because pole beans, correct? They they produce over a longer period of the season, but bush beans, they'll produce for a while. I don't know, four weeks about for here, and then they start to look ratty, and then you pull them up. That's right. Pull them out. And that's true of anything in the garden. Once the plant has stopped producing, your best thing is to pull it out, get rid of it, because leaving it there is just going to attract the kinds of pests that like to eat it, and then they overwinter in your soil, and then you'll just have problems forever. So in a vegetable garden, as soon as something stops producing, it's out of there. Right. And then you don't put green beans back in that exact same spot, right? Right. Try to find another spot in the garden for the green beans. If you have room, because you want to rotate your crops. And besides, if you have pests That's in right. that area, then if you go over and plant them in another spot, maybe those pests won't find them for a while. That's the idea. Speaking of pests, yes. let's go on to our dirt. Mm-hmm. D, you have mentioned several times that you do not have chipmunks in Oklahoma in your garden. I do not. I do not. I don't even think chipmunks are in Oklahoma. I don't know. Chipmunks are definitely in Indiana, and they definitely like to uh, dig around in the in the container plantings, especially. And I'll go out mm-hmm. and I'll see where they've dug a little bit. And 
it seems like every time I open my, my back door, there scoots off a chipmunk. And hmm. they can be destructive little boogers. I yeah. don't like them. Our friends that live in uh, Nashville, they have a lot of trouble with chipmunks. Okay, so I looked it up while you were talking, and uh, the eastern chipmunk is, uh, is in eastern Oklahoma. It's the western fringe Note the word fringe. I've never heard of anybody in Oklahoma complaining about chipmunks, but apparently they do exist somewhere in eastern Oklahoma. But I don't live in eastern Oklahoma. I live in the middle of Oklahoma, and I don't have chipmunks, for which I'm eternally grateful. I do have squirrels, armadillos, um, skunks, raccoons. So the other day, (laughs) snakes. I, I found a dead chipmunk. Gross. It was in my garage, and it was disgusting because it. Re- I thought, something smells bad in here. Ew. But I found it. So chipmunks are something that a lot of people think they're very cute because, you know, there's Disney's Chippendale. Yes, I know. And they're not cute. No, they especially are cute, when they're dead. But they're not cute. <laughs> then, And some people will trap them and then take them away and the thing is check local laws before you take a trapped animal and deposit it someplace else because in my county it's against the law to go dump a chipmunk or a squirrel or something (laughs) in in the parks or in somebody else's property and they also say if you don't take the chipmunk to the other side of a creek or a river or you know it'll find its way back to home which is your garden so. Oh my, that's hilarious! Well, and, <laughs> I'm glad I don't have chipmunks because the raccoons give me enough trouble. Yeah, we'll talk about the raccoons another day. Yuck! There's funny stories about raccoons. They're actually funny. They have funny habits. Yeah, uh, they're mean. I'm just saying they're mean. If yeah. you've had chickens, they're pretty mean. Okay, so the Brits have hedgehogs, and actually, did you know the hedgehog is becoming endangered in Great Britain? I read that somewhere. I read something about that. Yeah. And I live for the day when chipmunks become endangered in Indiana. <laughs> I live for the day. I don't think that's going to happen. And I, I, I vacillate back and forth between maybe I want to be one of those people that teaches chipmunks to come eat a peanut out of your hand. And no. <laughs> maybe I want to be one of those people that figures out how to get rid of them without making a mess. Yeah. Yeah, squirrels are kind of like that here, too. I mean, yeah, squirrels are squirrels the same like, way. They like to take one bite out of um, out of a tomato and then just walk away, which is really rude, but... Terrible. Terrible, terrible creatures. I did feed a squirrel once. Have I ever told you that story? No. What happened? Well, back when I used to camp at Lake Eufaula, which is down in southeastern Oklahoma... Uh, at the Bell Star campgrounds, they those squirrels were pretty tame because people were there all the time. And so there was this really cute little squirrel, and I was young, and I thought this was all a cute moment, and I was feeding the squirrel brownies, of all things. Brownies. Yeah. And so I handed a piece to it, and it was all so charming. He was sitting on my hand. I was feeding him. And then suddenly the squirrel decided he wanted to bite me instead. Because And the brownie That's, was right there. He just decided he'd bite my thumb instead. I knocked that squirrel all the way to the other side of the tree. I never fed a squirrel again. I learned my lesson. I was going to say, my, uh, my brother-in-law feeds a squirrel. They named the squirrel Graham Cracker because he feeds it Graham Crackers all the time. And it gets up on their front porch railing and sits there and waits for them to come out because it's, it's too fat. To do any of its own hunting now because all it eats is graham crackers. So I do. We should say that there are. If you're going to feed squirrels and chipmunks, don't feed them brownies. First of all, don't feed them brownies and don't feed them graham crackers. At least feed them like peanuts or something that has nutritious proteins and oils and things that they get in nature because they they turn very fat. As we would if all we ate was graham crackers. True. That's but. true. I was also thinking that I wonder if you feed them, if they become exactly like Japanese beetles. You just lure more to your area, you know? They all say, oh, that lady over there feeds us, so go over there, and then they'll eat your other stuff too. Can't t- you can't trust them. Can't trust them at all. No. 
No, you cannot trust them. And so I guess I'm not going to, I don't know what I'm doing with the chipmunks. I'm sorry. I would like to think that we can, I'd like to think that we can coexist (laughs) and I'm hopeful that we can coexist, but if we can't, I will have to take measures. Okay. And we'll talk about those later. The measures. Probably won't be anything that I want to confess to on a podcast. (laughs) Probably not. (laughs) You'll have the animal rights people after you. Oh, indeed. Let's let's stop right there. So do you think that in Australia they have troubles with kangaroos getting in their gardens? I know they do. They consider them pests just like we consider chipmunks. But they're big old pests with kicking legs. They're huge. No, thanks. No, thank you. (laughs) So anyway, that's about all we have time for today, D. D. That was hard to say. It is. <laughs> anyway, people can find us on thegardenangelist at gmail.com. We can be contacted there for email. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook where the, we are the Garden Angelist. D is also in those places as Red Dirt Ramblings, and I'm in... Instagram and Twitter as Indie Gardener, and I'm on Facebook as May Dreams Gardens. We'd love to have listeners check us out. And if you're listening on iTunes, we'd love for you to give us a review and help other people find the Garden Angelus podcast. Wow, yeah, you did a great job. Thanks. You're welcome. It, it's been great chatting with you over the garden gate, and I will talk to you soon. All right, bye now. Bye.